professor in electrical engineering at uh, UCLA in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And his vision is towards a future that is just filled with robots of every kind. And his research interests involve printable robotics, rapid design and fabrication, control systems, and wireless sensor networks. Um, he's received best paper awards in IEEE Robotics and Automation and the International Conference on Intelligent Robots and Systems. And he was named a UCLA Samueli Fellow in 2015. Uh, most importantly, He's a graduate of our own department. So please help me in welcoming Ankur Mehta. Thanks, Bjorn. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's kind of, uh, kind of weird being on this side of the table after many, many, many years on that side of the table. But uh, it's good to be back. Um, so I've got some, some slides today showing you what the work that I've done, what the work I'm planning on doing is. And I like things to be more interactive, so feel free to uh, speak up and ask questions along the way. Uh, we'll, try to, we'll try to keep things to the requisite time limit, but um, we'll see how things go. So I'd like to start with, very quickly, uh, uh, look, let's, let's uh, do some history. Does anybody know when the first commercial computer was? When, when it was uh, made available? When was that? OK, so the, um, the, I think you're thinking in terms of personal computers. How about the? I mean, first commercial uh, handphone. Like, you know. No, yeah. OK, uh, yeah, no, no, the, but, uh, well, there was, there's a lot of debate on the different ones. There's the one right. at UPenn, there's the ENIAC, there's the Harvard one. You had uh, all these different ones. But the first one was probably out of um, uh, Iowa, this guy that came up with it. He's the accidental process designer. Do you know when that was? Uh, that was in the 30s. Okay. Well, um, so that was that, that was probably the one. Uh, I don't I don't know that one you're referring to. So, <laughs> right. So in in my my in my class, I go all the way back to you know you know the the Jewish golems and everything that can be somehow considered computing. The, sort of the first major uh, commercially available um, general computing machine was the uh, Franti Mark One in 1951. That was one month up before the UNIVAC, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, that went to the US Census Bureau to do some uh, comp computation there. How about the first robot? Any ideas? Define robot, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's, of course, plenty of definitions just of, as computing. So the sort of the first robot, what we consider industrial robots doing physical automation tasks for manufacturing happened 10 years later. In 1961, the Unimate was a, an assembly line robot at General Motors. So we see about a 10-year difference from when computation became readily available to when physical automation became readily available. So what happened, so like compared to now, what, what happened 10 years ago? Any, any ideas? Did anything major happen 10 years ago? Yep. So we, uh, 10 years ago was the launch of the iPhone where we, we, started, we started to become uh, made aware of the idea that we could have readily available computation anywhere, anytime. And now, 10 years later, we actually have this, this thought with, you know, the, with smartphones and smart watches and laptops and, and, and other kinds of devices. We now have computation immediately available at our fingertips. Anytime you have a computational question, there's an app for that. We can find a solution. So, 10 years later, uh, what we'd like to do is take that same paradigm and apply it to physical automation. This idea of physical uh, or pervasive robots. That for any physical task we want automated, we want to be able to say there's a robot for that. And so more specifically, we want robots that are ubiquitous. Everybody, everywhere should be able to have robots to solve whatever physical task they may be. And for whatever those tasks may be, there is a robot for it. So. Um, this idea of custom personal robots, and we can, we can talk about a lot of sort of application spaces. Yeah? I think there is, yeah. So, um, you know, th and I think the, the point that was mentioned back there is exactly what it is. Like, what is useful, what is useless? 
you may have some idea of what is useful and what's useless. Somebody else may have a very different idea. And we'll see in two slides, if we can give the ability to create these robots to the user, they get to decide what's useful and, and useless. And somebody who wants it should be able to create it. And that's the exact thing that happened with computation. And that's, that's where, where I would like to go with robotics. And so you know, there's, there's many, you know, here I've put a bunch of sort of generally considered useful applications. So you know, mobile health or, or home medicine or, or space uh, exploration. Education is a, is a big area that I'm interested in. But regardless, there are many such problems. Um, and there's, there's a, a much larger class of problems where we don't really know, like I can't tell you what the specification is, or you know, y we, we may not have the idea. One, one, a, a, thing, a, uh, a story that I like to give is that we go to uh, robotics conferences, and there's thousands of papers there. And in the entire conference, you'll see a grand total of maybe five kinds of robots. Because we roboticists are an uncreative bunch. And I include myself in this. So what we'd rather do is we'd take, we'd, rather than me coming up with the problem and then therefore a solution, just like with the iPhone, rather than a developer or a, a computer scientist coming up with the apps that are necessary, we want to put the creation of robots into the hands of the end users. And what do we need to make that happen? Well, the design has to happen at, in, at a sort of intuitive level. Rather than requiring lots of expertise and experience, it needs to be able to be done by somebody at the more general public. Absolutely. So that's a good point. Um, and in the next slide, I'll, I'll delve into that analogy a little bit in more detail. This idea of uh, trading off a general purpose machine that can be programmed to tasks versus an application specific machine. But so um, uh, before I get there, just, just a, 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 a brief overview of the things that we'll be looking at, what it takes to, to uh, enable the creation of, of personal machines. It needs to be designed. It needs to be manufactured, again, by through rapidly manufactured and inexpensively at a home user level. And then it needs to be able to be controlled by the users themselves. And so autonomy is, is sort of a, a necessary criterion here. And finally, um, as engineers, we, we are well aware of the design, build, test, iteration. This is something that, as, uh, as a casual user, needs to, needs to be done on a much faster scale so that, they can, that this entire process can be repeated until a final successful design is converged upon. And so, uh, like the professor mentioned, um, this analogy of, of smartphones to, uh, to personal robots may break down a little bit. But let's instead, I'm an electrical engineer, let's consider circuits. So the, the, the world of electronic circuits sort of started at one end with, with ASIC, application-specific integrated circuits, where the entire design was custom created from the ground up for a specific application, where you lay out every transistor, you size every transistor, and you, you come up with very high-performance single-task machines. And we see a lot of that in the robotics world. So you know, toys or you know, the self-driving car, or various robots. The mechanics, the electronics, the software, it's all put together for that one specific uh, design. And when you want to come up with something new, you start from scratch and do it all over again. At the other end of the spectrum, and this is sort of where the, the iPhone came into play, and um, you know, in electronics, this idea of, of an uh, FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array, where you have a single device that is very multi-purpose and you program it with the software needed to accomplish a task. And we see that in the robotics world as well, where you have the, you know, the, these large humanoid robots, PR2, Baxter, that uh, are meant to be very, uh, very multifaceted, can do a lot of things OK and nothing really very well. In the electronics world, we have a space in between uh, that, that's accomplished by, let's say, digital, digital design, where you don't need to, to lay out each transistor directly. You lay out functional blocks. Or at the rapid prototyping level, you have breadboards, where you take discrete components and, and, uh, and sort of hack them together to come up with, with your electronic prototypes. And that's the space that I want to uh, attach, uh, attack with the, um, oops, with, uh, in the robotics world. So to be clear, I'm not trying to uh, replace any of the existing robotic development, but rather open up some new space where typically, or currently, robotics does not uh, address by, by coming up with new design and manufacturing mechanisms to fill that gap. And so uh, sort of the driving big picture vision that, I'm, that I'd like to get to in, in some number of years that encompasses all of this is to be able to 
automatically go from a high-level vision, some task specification, all the way down to a physical custom uh, printable machine that accomplishes that. So maybe 20, 50 years down the road, we'll go to our, our terminal and type in, I need a robot to, let's say, play chess. It'll go through and figure out what that means, what behaviors need to be executed, how, how we can do this with electromechanical machines, put it all together, and design our chess playing robot that we can then go and have it uh, you know, entertain us for some time. So that's a, a toy example. Let me give you a real example that, uh, that I encountered. Uh, a colleague of mine was putting together a MOOC, a massive online education course, and wanted to have, uh, have, it have a design component where the students could create a robot to do something. Now, I, I wasn't involved with the education part, but I got this email from him that said, I want a robot. Can you design me a robot? And he sent me this email. And it's exactly like that. And ultimately, we'd like to get to the point where that goes into a machine or into some design system and out comes the robot that, that they want. We're not there yet, but now, you know, me being a part of the machine, I can go through, read what that means and say, all right, well, we want some, some rotational axes. Let's get some hinges in there that have, have some actuation. Uh, tool, I don't know what a tool is, so I'll just put a general multipurpose gripper stick it all together, and then from when I got that email, an hour later, we got uh, an arm that has a user interface, that has the, the right firmware and programming, all that. Now, that, that took me an hour, because I designed the system and I know how to use it. Um, it'll, you know, the first time anyone does it, it'll take some more time. I sent that to him. He's like, wait, no, I don't want a, a gripper, I want it to hold a pen. So it's, you know, it doesn't need to be something that general. All right, 10 minutes later, I replaced that one gripper with a pen, and we have a new, new robot. So how do we get there? So that, that's the, the, the vision of where we're going. And so in this talk, I'll, I'll sort of talk about the three parts that we, that we need to do there, design, manufacturing, and control. So uh, I'll start with just an, an overview of how these parts fit together with the example that I gave earlier, this idea of a chess playing robot. Now we start with the high level task, which is play chess, and it needs to be broken down into its functional elements. What are the, 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 the behaviors necessary to accomplish this goal? So we need some kind of mobility across the chessboard. It needs to interact with the pieces. It needs to do so with some kind of intelligence. Each one of these behaviors can be turned into an electromechanical module, some, some uh, physical uh, component that accomplishes that behavior. And so we can have me uh, wheels for, for mobility, maybe wheels, maybe legs. We can sort of find various ideas there. Uh, a gripper to interact with the pieces. Ultimately, we'll, we'll want some kind of chess logic to play well. But regardless, we'll need some, some pick and place logic. How do you lift a piece and move it and so on? And of course, the core uh, power and processing and all that. We take all of those modules, each one of those electromechanical components, and we put it all together into a single design, a single robot that contains all of those functionalities and generate a mechanical design, some, some piece of CAD that can get sent off to a mechanical manufacturing. An electrical design, a, a bill of materials and some uh, um, <coughs> Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, bill of materials and some wiring diagrams, some some uh, some software and some firmware that runs it all th uh, that uh, that ties it all together. We include the the specific um, we include the specific details from this actual problem. It's a 50 by 50 centimeter chessboard, or each piece weighs 100 grams, and with that we can generate a manufacturing plan. Put that through the manufacturing, we get our physical device. Once we have that, all we need to do is program it and then uh, load up the firmware on the machine, load up the, 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 the human interface software, and unfortunately the video is not playing, but you would see the, the robot go ahead and deliver a checkmate and, and play your, your game. So we'll start with the design process. How do we go from this vision of, of what we want to an actual uh, design? And so we can compare these to electronic design automation for, for hardware systems or or app engines that, that can generate uh, software apps for you based on functionality. And basically, we start from some high-level definition, some, something that encodes the results that we need to get out of it. Go through some kind of optimization procedure that, that generates uh, manufacturable designs in, in a way that, that we can verify, that we can ensure accomplishes our goals. And uh, so an example of um, what, where we're trying to go with this, right now, if we have a user that's trying to design a system, they may have uh, some, some, some design tools that they use, and they ask it some questions. How, how strong is this material? You know, how fast will this, this uh, transducer run? And they get some answers, and using those, those answers, they'll go ahead and create the design of, of the system themselves. 
the long range vision that we that that I started with was to have the the user give the specification to a design tool, and the design tool itself will output the the design of the robot. But now there's also a a, a subtle caveat in here, which is that in this case, the user needs to know what the specification even is. And a, a, as you may have encountered over the course of your engineering projects, just specifying the project requires experience and expertise. And so rather than treating the user as the driver, as the uh, initiator of the design process, instead what we really want to go to is the, the system, the design tool itself, is the main action ac actor. And they ask questions to the user to try to extract what the, the, the uh, specification is, get the answers from the user, and use that to generate the design. And so we, we want the, the user in the loop, but we, want, we, we treat the user as another sensing modality of our design system. And in order to do that, we're going we're gonna to take our design process and break it out into a number of nested layers, where at each uh, layer of, of the design, we'll add a layer of abstraction that takes uh, information away from, from the user and generate some kind of automated design process. On, yep. on that note, I think it would be great if there's yet one more output layer. For instance, the system could ask, when would you like to play chess with me? I have a solution where we can play chess in 15 minutes, because I simply tell you what the move is that I would make, and you actually do the move. Or you can wait 24 hours until we have that little robot, so you don't have to lift your arm and do the move yourself. And you said, no, I, I'd rather do the move for you, but I want to play now. Like, so that would be really in the, in the meta level of the design process where the system actually offers several options, only one of which may be a robotic solution. Absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a great point that um, when, it comes, when, when you start abstracting away design decisions into specifications, you start growing the, the, the possible solutions and in, in a sort of a, a very sort of nonlinear exponential way where, like you said, one solution may involve robotics, one solution may involve uh, an, like a purely interactive design. And you know, these are, they, they get tied into, you know, we'll, we'll um, hopefully discuss that a little bit towards the end, this idea of optim optimization, where there are, many, uh, there are many parameters over which we can optimize, time to, to manufacture, or accuracy, or cost, or effectiveness, or whatever it may be. And, Hopefully with, this, with these design layers, we can then include that outer layer, which says, here are a number of op options. You pick which one you like, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So yeah. So in order to accomplish these layers, at the center, we're going to make use of this idea of software-defined hardware, where all of our, um, our components that go into these robotic designs will be encoded as software scripts. And each of these scripts is defined, is, is characterized in terms of its functionality. What is it that this, uh, this component does? And it can be parameterized so a family of related functionalities can be encoded by the same, uh, the same software block. And so we can have mechanical elements, we can have electrical elements, we can have software elements, and they can all be sort of defined in such a way that, you know, th what does the script do? The script, when executed, generates the, the manufacturing model or the manufacturing design to accomplish that functionality. And so we could have, you know, for example, for a mechanical piece, we could have some, some cut and fold pattern if we wanted to origami style fold this out of paper. Or we can have a 3D solid model. One additional thing we can generate, which we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make use of later on, is, is a mathematical functional model, which describes the behavior of, of, of key uh, parameters of the system in terms of the parameterization of the, the component, as well as whatever input-output relations it may have. And so for a mechanical component, that may include the, the geometric positions of various key points. For electric uh, components, it may include voltage and current relationships and so on. So we'll, we'll use that model a bit later. But uh, with the, function, with the sorry, manufacturable specifications, we can now go through and start building a library of components, building a set of designs that we can use to create our robots. So we can have structural building box like beams and polyhedron, hinges and joints. We can have electrical building blocks that may include some electromechanical things like motors and, and sensors and actuators, electronics, switches, whatever it may be. We can have software building blocks all the way from low-level hardware drivers to high-level control structures. We can involve the, the human as well, get some user interface blocks, and so try to get data to and from the user, maybe with some app widgets. And with all of these, we can start, you know, with these scripts, we can put them together to, to code up uh, a hardware, uh, an electromechanical design of a robot. 
But we can take this software-defined hardware and now wrap it in a higher layer so that we can do hierarchical modular composition. Each one of these scripts will get, in, get in, uh, uh, encoded into a component, which we can then assemble into our robotic design. So we take these various scripts and wrap it in an object-oriented programming uh, interface so that every script, whether it's a mechanical component, electrical component, software component, looks the same to a, uh, in an object-oriented way. And so it'll have some, some input interfaces and some output interfaces. And it'll have some, uh, some implementation algorithms within it that can generate whatever the fabrication specifications are. And we can do this hierarchically. And so within the same object-oriented framework, we can create a new component as a composition of subcomponents. And we have the, the, the algorithms to compose them in such a way that the result is still a, component, a valid component with input interfaces and output, input and output interfaces. And, um, and so now, rather than writing the code for an entire uh, robot, we can do it with some kind of logical connectivity. So we can take two beams and join it with a flexible hinge and create a finger. We're not limited to just mechanical components or like components. We can take, for instance, uh, an, uh, an electromechanical motor, connect it on one side to a PWM driver, connect it on the other side to a, a mechanical leg. So we can get this integrated uh, component which has mechanical parts, software parts, hardware parts, that would be a moving leg. And now we can say, let's combine some of these moving legs into a robot and sort of build up a, our, these integrated electromechanical designs from the ground up. We can design robots like this, but let's go and take it one level higher. And rather than defining our robot in terms of, in terms of the, the modules, the components that build it up, let's instead specify it by its functionality. And so we, rather than defining how a robot is, we define what the robot does. And um, in order to do that, we make use of a formal logic uh, uh, language uh, called linear temporal logic, which is a, a Boolean algebra that in, encodes time-dependent uh, uh, relationships between variables. And so we can, we can have propositions that represent state of a robot or sensor, sensing or actuation information, and we can combine them with these time-dependent Boolean operators to define our functionality and to sort of make it more accessible, to make it, um, to make it more understandable what this is, we can write this as a structured English language. So this is, a, this is a formal programming language that has a grammar. But you read this, and you can get an understanding of what this, this uh, is meant to do. And so we can, we can take descriptions in structured English, reduce them to a linear temporal logic uh, um, program, and use that to define, our, uh, to define our robot. And one nice thing about this is that we can, we can share designs, and we can uh, modify designs. And, we don't need to be an engineer to, to remix uh, uh, one existing robot into a new robot that, we, that may be more carefully tailored to our, uh, to our personal needs. But so we, we, from this structured English definition, we want to go through and, and generate our robotic system. And so we can do that. And in fact, we can prove, we can guarantee safety and liveness. That is, our robot does what we want it to do and doesn't do what we don't want it to do, provided we, make, uh, we make, maintain these two constraints. First, that we have a one-to-one -one mapping between our propositions in our, in our language and our components in our, from our library. And that's an easy enough thing to in ensure. The other thing we need to make sure is that, the, that when we map our propositions to our robotic components, it's consistent. We don't want to say, map a motion action to a, uh, to a light sensing action. They, that, those would be inconsistent. So in order to do that, this is where we bring our, our, our user into the loop. But we, um, we use our, again, we use our design system to aid the user. And so this is called grounding, where we map our propositions to our, uh, to our components in our design library. And we, we sort of filter our library. We can, based on, the, um, based on the propositions and how they fit within the language, we can identify whether they're a sensing proposition or uh, an actuation. Uh, whether they interface with other uh, parts of the robot, whether they interface with the user. And we can sort of break it up into the various classes of propositions. Similarly, we can go through our design library, our library of components, and given that each one fits the same object-oriented interface, we can extract information about what kind of component they are. 
And by doing that, we can match one to the other. And so if we have some kind of physical uh, interface proposition, we can find some physical interface components that have, uh, that could be like a motor depending on, uh, a motor if it's uh, an, uh, an, uh, a state input generating a mechanical output, if it was a, an actuation, it could be a switch if it were the other way around. And depending on which, um, <coughs> depending on what the, what class of proposition it is, we can find a, a subset of the library that matches its characteristics, and then the user can go through and pick from a reduced set of options which one is the best. And so in this case, the user may be presented with either wheels or legs to achieve a, a motion proposition. And those, it's up to the user. It's something that either one will matches the, it will be a consistent choice and therefore can uh, achieve our, our safety and liveness guarantees. We can actually go a step further. And so this is where I, I mentioned the, the, the physical model that comes out of these designs. And this is something we're working on currently, which is taking the physical model and using that to further refine the, the, the filters in, in our library. So knowing what we know about how the, uh, how the components will react and how they will behave, we can match them even closer to the actual logic in the LTL spec. Okay, and so doing this, we get a grounding. We get the, uh, the components of each of the, that match each of the propositions in the library, in the spec. And now we just need to put them together. We need to assemble them all into a single, uh, into a single robot. Once again, we'll make use of an assisted user in the loop process. We'll start by just uh, uniformly arranging the components around, sort of uh, symmetrically around a center. That it's, it a lot of the designs tend to be like that. But if a user looks at this and sees it is inconsistent, it doesn't match, then, then they can go ahead and specify, for instance, the, 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 the part that needs to interact with the pieces is at the front of the robot. And the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the sensor for the, to, to detect the game board needs to be at the, on the bottom of the robot. Now, once again, this is something that we can refine further by using the, the model and by simulating the, the generated model to make sure that the behavior of the, 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 the laid out components matches the specification. And that's something we're working on right now. But once we get all of these, uh, these pieces together, we have the full design. We run the scripts, the, the, the software-defined hardware. We run them to generate the manufacturing specs and create our, our, uh, our, our robot uh, designs, electrical, mechanical, and software components. Ultimately, what we want to do now is wrap all of that in one final outside, um, outside layer of, of abstraction, which is some high-level design input. So rather than having to specify the functionality directly at the, at the LTL precision level, we want to go to some natural interaction with the user. How do we, how do we uh, do have this back and forth between the user that most broadly makes this system uh, accessible to as many people? And so we need to develop the algorithms to handle a natural input. And so we have a, a few ideas of, of where we're addressing with this. And there's, there's sort of a lo lot of op opportunities to go with this. We have the infrastructure, and now we need to, to use it to come up with design tools. Maybe we'll uh, extend our structured English to a natural English language. Natural English has a lot of connotations and inflections that makes it harder for a computer to parse, but makes it a richer description of functionality, which we can hopefully extract uh, more, preci uh, more precise meaning and a more precise specification from. So people are working very hard at it, and we're not there yet, even for apps. Yeah. So, um, but right, absolutely. And so that's where. Um, I think the uh, we're 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 past that point in in robotics as well. You know, this ability to modularize robotic functionality and compose functional blocks. The uh, what's limiting us right now. Are, is twofold. One is the interface. How do we interact with that? And that's the that's the slide right here. Um, and, and the other is is a cost question. And that, that I'll talk about that a bit in the manufacturing section, which is which is coming uh, coming up next. But um, yeah. So looking at that particular robot design, I have a feeling that if you have a crowded test floor and a move has to happen in the center of the test floor, that this thing is too big. It cannot get there in order to without disturbing other parts. Where in the whole design uh, hierarchy would that flaw have to be caused? Is the team responsible for that, or, or, or where is the thing like that, you know, taken taken care of? Absolutely. So right now, the, these uh, these sort of like runtime errors 
they're, they're, they have to get caught by the user during operation. And that's where this whole idea of, of rapid design iteration comes into play. Things like that, we don't right now have a great, uh, a, a great ability to handle in general um, at this, uh, at th within this hierarchy. However, something like uh, simply whether or not you can move through the, through the game board without bumping into pieces, that's something that, will, that can come out of simulation. I'll talk a little bit about that during the, the control section. We can simulate environmental contact and, 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 and kinematics so that we can say, well, as you ran through this pro program, the end result is not what we expected. Something is amiss. And we, you, you can backtrack through and say, well, here it, it can't fit through this gap or something. So things like motion um, and, and sort of like interaction with the environment, that's something we can, we can simulate. But there are a lot more runtime errors that you may, may find. And it could be something where, you know, if, if there's some human interaction where maybe you, you have a, a screen that's trying to present information to the user, but as you move, the leg obscures the screen. That's something that comes out of the design build test iteration. It, um, that's, you know, that's a, that, that gets into a little bit of philosophy. Uh, I, I, would, I would love to say it's going to happen soon. I don't think that we, we really have the, the understanding to be able to, to, to get to that anytime soon. I think there will always, at least in, in the next 10 years, the user will have to be in there somewhere. There needs to be sort of the human, the user, the end, end user sort of defining the entire broad spectrum of, of what constitutes a successful test. But maybe eventually we'll get there. Maybe eventually we don't want to get there. Maybe there's always going to be some sort of personality that, that we need to imbue to these, these systems. I don't know. We'll see. But <coughs> all right. And so uh, just uh, one, one additional uh, thing to sort of touch on, on what you're saying is like, w how do we get there? Like, what do we, we have the infrastructure that, that I just showed to generate that. And it's not just mine. There's many other sort of design um, uh, abstractions for robotic systems. But we, we need to get some way of, of interacting with the users and trying to, trying to pull this together to make thousands of designs. And you know, we, in the apps world, we have Stack Overflow and we have, uh, you know, we have app, uh, um, you know, GitHub and, and sort of repositories that people use to build up what they, what they uh, can draw from to make their new designs. And so we're working on a web-based uh, interface to, for robotics, uh, trying to come up with a, a user-friendly way to guide users through the steps in making, uh, in design, coming up with these uh, robot designs. And you know, we have an idea where you have some blocks of functionality, you drag them into the workspace, it presents what the, the best guess design is, and allows the user to sort of interact with it in, in the, the sort of the give and take to converge on the final design. OK, so we have ways of creating designs. Let's now build it. Let's turn it into a, a physical system. And so in order to do that, we need ways of building these machines, electromechanical machines. We have the mechanical subsections, the electrical subsections, that programming. We need to find tools and, uh, and systems to, to build these in, in sort of a combined way. And we may even want to go ahead and build the components themselves, these, these actuators and these robot elements um, to do so. And so um, in, it, within this, let's uh, to just as, a, as an example that, that'll drive the manufacturing, let's look at just a, a simpler version of the chess playing robot, just the mobile base, the two wheels. This is sort of simple enough we can define it at any level of the hierarchy inside that, those layers. Here's one definition, which is sort of the modular way, where we define the modules and the connectivity between them. This, this is a, a user interface that we created that turns this into our, our two-wheeled robot design. In order to build it, we can make use of any number of tools. So here, sort of the canonical way of, of building it is 3D printing. And in fact, in this case, we can augment 3D printing with, uh, with by adding in components. So it, you, if you can sort of see, there's a servo in, in the center of that thing. We pause the printing, move the head away, drop the servo in, and continue printing around it. And in doing so, we can get our two-wheeled vehicle that is, has a 3D printed body. Now, 3D printing is nice because you can build a whole range of, of designs. It has some challenges. First of all, um, it takes a really long time, as anyone who's used a 3D printer before knows. It has some, some variable yield, which is generally not very good. Often you end up with a pile of spaghetti, um, and you know one th one thing you know that we're we're that is is changing now is this you're you're very good at building strong rigid structures, but you're not it, it's not very good at at designing motion. And if we're talking about robots, we need we generally want some kind of motion. So instead, um, an, another 
um, another style of manufacturing is cut and fold. So here you print out a 2D, uh, a 2D unfolding of the design, cut it out. Here I cut it out by hand, or you can use a, an automated paper cutter to cut it out, and you fold it up. You've, you have the lines, you fold it up, and similar to 3D printing, you can incorporate the electronics in as you go. You, you, you take your folding, you stick in your motors and, and whatever other electronics uh, in, in the design. And ultimately, you end up with a folded structure, again, that matches the, the design. The, the manufacturing drawings, whether it's the 3D printing, whether it's the cut and fold, are all generated from the, the same design files. Now, this is nice because it's, uh, it's cheap. Paper is, is plenty, plentifully available. Um, it's actually pretty quick. Now, it takes me about five minutes to assemble this because I've done this many times. The first time you do it, it maybe takes you 20 minutes, half an hour. As you do it more, you'll, you'll get faster. But even so, it's still faster than a 3D printer, which takes four or five hours. Um, it's nice because the paper, the, the structure itself, is inherently compliant. And so you can build mobile structures out of this. But you also do need to be aware that now, along with the compliance, comes a, a reduction in rigidity. So you need to, worry, you need to be concerned with the, the strength of, of the, the rigid elements. We can come up with new, new manufacturing processes to sort of get the best of both worlds. So here we have uh, this idea of self-folding, where we, um, we, we take the, the folded designs and build them out of a multi-layer stack of, of, of stiff and shape memory materials, so that when you put, the, design, when you put the, the resulting stack in an oven under uniform self-heating, the entire thing folds up on, on its own to the right uh, geometries. Um, I didn't have the, the final version. But, um, or you could sort of make some, some hybrid combination of folding some parts and 3D printing other parts to save on time, to save on weight, and so on. Ultimately, you can have a number of different designs. A, depending on which fabrication tools you have available to you, the same design can be resolved in any of these ways to generate, um, to generate your, your solution. And once again, there's a bunch of trade-offs between them. Ideally, the highest level of, of abstraction would, would, would be able to, to know what these trade-offs are and say, Given that you're pressed for time, you want to use this process. Or given that you're pressed for cash, you want to use this other process. So in, in all those designs, we made use of uh, a mechanical structure and incorporated the electronics within them. We can, we can start trying to integrate the, the ma manufacturing as well by making use of this sort of distributed control, where, where we, we map the mechanical, uh, we, we, we map the compliance or the, the actuation to the mechanical structure, and we can uh, distribute um, we can distribute brains, distribute processors around it, so that the uh, the structure and the electronics and the intelligence are all encoded in sort of the same geometry. And with that, we can now talk about manufacturing with some integrated process, where rather than building the mechanics and incorporating the electronics, we do it all in one go, either through pick and place assembly. So we saw how we dropped in the electronics to a 3D printer. We can try to incorporate, build machines to do that automatically. We can make use of intelligent substrates. So in the folding case, we can, we can encode the, the circuits directly into the folded substrate by making use of conductive uh, metamaterials. We can just even think about directly 3D printing the actuators themselves. And for that, um, just to, to give you an idea of how many years I spent back there, this was something I did in my first year uh, here as a grad student 10 years ago. Uh, this idea of <coughs> building MEM structures and then incorporating them into with, along with an integrated uh, microcontroller and radio and power systems to be able to build a robot element. So a discrete unit that incorporates some amount of processing and, and uh, mechanical actuation and so on that you can now 3D print in, in multiples to achieve whatever design, uh, whatever design you want. <coughs> OK, finally, now that we have our, our system designed and built, we need to do something with it. We need to control it. And there's sort of a lot of modes that we may interact with these robotic systems. And it could be a fully uh, human-operated teleoperation where the user like, specifies every aspect of the motion. There could be some kind of integrated feedback control, some, some level of autonomy, all the way up to fully autonomous behavior. And we can talk about even higher level uh, um, design considerations. We can distribute control across multiple robots. If you can build one, you might as well build 10. You can talk about under-actuated robots. How do we minimize our designs? We can talk about security and so on. Um, ultimately, we want to be able to, to generate some code, some programs, some firmware and software that runs on these systems. 
So we can do it using the same design interface where we include control blocks into the uh, into our in our into our design into our design library. They could be user element user interface elements that directly control the uh, the uh, the actuators. We can replace the the user interface elements with with feedback controller blocks to make some kind of autonomous behavior. So here we have a, uh, <coughs> a thing that's not playing. A we're playing slowly. It's a, an autonomous line follower that is designed. So the 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 flowchart over there is exactly the modular composition that generates these designs. And in fact, we can go all the way up to our our our, our highest level of design automation, where we where we do a behavioral specification of the of the system, and that can get resolved into an actual finite state machine implementation of the LTL spec, and turned into a controller that that goes directly into the system for fully autonomous behavior. And now this this is where we can start talking about how how accurately does this system uh, achieve our goals. So we can include some environmental uh, some environmental contact and some some uh, kinematics and, and generate a simulation that can model the, uh, the the resulting behavior. So here you can see the the robot which was actually manufactured, and on, on the the overlay is the simulated results of of the line following robot that was sort of specified directly from uh, an LTL spec. So, <coughs> like as I mentioned, you know if we can if we can get one robot. Wouldn't it be nice to get a bunch of robots? So we, we can start thinking about trying to, to um, trying to control these robots in swarms, in multi-robot swarms. And we can talk about um, dividing up tasks amongst robots, or in, even dividing up behaviors amongst robots. Trying to do um, trying to do complicated or higher order behaviors with a, a, a sequence or a collection of robots. And we can now talk about how do we divide up different, L, uh, different behaviors of the task amongst different robots that may be heterogeneous. We can talk about optimization. How do we, how do we compute these sort of distributed um, algorithms in such a way that maximizes our utility? So we, we can, each robot has some actuation capabilities. We can move around. But then we can also communicate between them, and we can do processing on different ones. How do we allocate resources across a, a distributed set of, set of uh, robots in order to achieve our goals. Um, ultimately, this all comes down to what, what we want is robots everywhere. We want robots throughout our homes doing everything that we want, accessible by the end user. Right? We want to put the robots everywhere in the world just as much as computation is right now. And so here in, you know, in this talk, I sort of went through all of the, the bits and pieces that, that we're, we're working on to, to, to achieve this goal. And now it's, there's a lot of integration as well, a higher order uh, combination of all these things to, to put together to get our robots every, for everyone everywhere. So I'd like to end with a picture of the, the students in my, in my lab that, are, that have done a lot of the work here and have generated some of the videos and, and things that you saw. And I'd like to now you know, thank you and ask for any questions that you may have. Right. If you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll run the mic to you, so we can have the questions also recorded on the video. Hi. Uh, thank you for sharing your vision today. Um, so you covered a lot of different types of um, components of your vision. I'm just wondering, where are you now at this point? What is your focus? and what has been done so far in, in your field in regards to realizing your vision? Right. So um, most of the, like all the videos that you saw in here are things that we are now able to do. So we have sort of the, the next to, to last, not the outermost layer, but one level in of the design process where we can come up with, where we can generate designs using a functional specification. And we have the infrastructure to be able to resolve the functional specification into a component list and, and merge them all into a single software-defined specification that we can parameterize and, and generate the manufacturable specs for. We can, cr we can manufacture them using this sort of uh, kind of uh, hacked-together 3D printing solution where you print some of it and you pause and you integrate actuation. We have the ability to, to manufacture them using the, the cut-and-fold method where it automatically resolves to an unfolding pattern, which you can then cut out either automatically or manually and fold up. Um, it, and you know, we, we've, we've worked on the, the other manufacturing processes. Uh, we have the ability to generate controllers automatically. 
whether through any of these design tools. And we have the ability to, to, um, to have one robot autonomously or human, or human interactively work on some projects. Where we're, trying, where we're working on right now, the active areas of research, in the design section are trying to go to a higher level of design, including this you know, design recommendation process where we have a library of designs that, that give the system some understanding of how systems, how designs get put together. And so when you include one wheel, it'll suggest put in another wheel because every time it has, you built a wheeled robot, you have at least two. Or maybe you know, if, you, um, you know, if, you're, if you're trying to put in some kind of, uh, uh, or if, if you want to put in a speech recognition, or if you want to inter interact in a speech way, then it'll say, all right, well, why don't you find an Arduino phone, or sorry, an Android phone and stick that in the way. How do we, um, how do we come up with this sort of back and forth process between the, the, the user and the design tool in a, sort of a, a, mass, uh, a mass achievable way? So the, this sort of web-based design tool. So that's, so that's one area that we're building, is the web-based design tool with the high-level design automation. In the manufacturing, we're trying to do this, um, the, both the, the hybrid metamaterials, trying to incorporate the intelligence into the mechanical structure so that the electronics and, me and mechanics can get co-manufactured. We're also working on, um, on ways of, of building these rock souls, the, the robot elements using MEMS, so that we can, we can sort of come up with these actuators and sensors piecemeal uh, as we assemble them all together. And finally, in control, we're, we're really pushing forward on this, this idea of distributed control. Since we now have the ability to make individual robots quickly, we want to get multiple robots involved. And so there's a lot of algorithmic work on how do, we, how do we optimize? How do we define an optimization problem? And then how do we solve this optimization problem across a heterogeneous system of robots? And maybe this, this task allocation problem, especially when it comes to human in the loop. How do we give some tasks to a human? How do we de decide which tasks go to a robot? And what's the best allocation of them? Obstacle to having a robot fold the robot instead the, of you yeah. having to fold the robot. So you know the the biggest obstacle is that I don't have tenure yet, so I need to make sure it doesn't fire me before I can finish it. Um, no, I think dexterity is 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 a big one, right? Folding requires very dexterous fingers, and especially when it comes to some of these designs, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of sort of uh, very careful like small uh, small elements and, and things that. We don't really have the, the automation to handle that kind of, that level of detail. Large scale folding we can, we can do, and you know, even this sort of, this idea of the, the self folding where you saw me put the thing into the, the toaster oven, we, we can do that for, for large scale things, and that's almost the robot folding itself, where you, you build a stack, you, you cut it through a laser, and then you put it in the oven. It's, but you know, as we start getting more complicated and more fiddly, it doesn't scale very well. So that's, I think, the, the, the biggest obstacle we have there. Oh. There was a point raised about runtime errors being a potential source of problems. I was wondering whether there's like room for a simulation environment with in, in between some of the blocks or a new block. Uh, like you mentioned LTL, like a behavioral description of things and simulation being a part of that block. So am I right in saying that a robust block like that would cause these errors to sort of not be an issue? So it's, it's um it's a process. The more, the more we can automate, the more we can simulate, the more we can, we can do within the design tool, the, the more useful it'll be. The, the fewer errors we'll run into, the more we can uh, create an optimal solution. But one of the things that we noted, we actually we, we did a test run of, of this system at a hackathon um, earlier this year. Response time is key. You know, a lot of this, this, this gets into design. When we're talking about design automation, there's the designer on one side, the computer on the other. If it takes even five seconds to generate a simulation, then you're not going to like. Then you start uh, you start getting frustrated with the system, and you 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 eventually put it away and just do it by hand. And you, a lot of the students that we that were at the hackathon that did it, would much rather just build a thing and test it out and see that it, that it doesn't work, rather than wait five seconds you know every every minute or so f to generate a new simulation. So as comp as we we make better algorithms, as we sort of uh, improve our our computational underpinnings of the system, we will, will include more and more automation into the design process to minimize the, the runtime errors that, that will happen. But as always, you know, the, the, the idea of, of the human computer action drives a lot of the, the design decisions of the system. 
Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, it seems like we are building tomorrow today, as we should, actually, as engineers do. My question is, have you considered uh, uh, this line of thinking in teaching robotics? Absolutely. So this, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, education is one of the, the areas where, where I really see this, this making a big difference. And especially when it comes to this, the, the printable robots, a sheet of paper is very easy to mail. It's very easy to, to, to generate and send. And you know, with this, we can actually give robots to whoever wants one. You know, this idea of a robot in every classroom, a robot for every student, not just in the US, but around the world, Robotics has the, you know, it, it occupies a sort of very special position where not only is it very educational in that it can teach computation, programming, arithmetic, logical thinking, it can teach things like design and artistic uh, expression and so on, but it's also just incredibly engaging. And, you know, this is something that we, we give to students and they can personalize it, they can create it themselves, and they're hooked. Uh, we, we did a, I, I don't have the slides here, uh, we did a, a test run with some middle school students and you know, we gave them the, the, the paper and they would cut it out and fold it up and make these, these wheeled robots. And the thing that, the first thing that their teacher said after the hour was done was this was the first time she had ever seen the entire class do anything for an hour, a, one hour from start to finish. It's, because it's so engaging, because it's so educational, it really behooves us to get this as pub as accessible as possible, and I think that's been one of my personal drives for all of this. So, uh, last question over here. Hi, uh, thanks. I had one more detail question. I I saw the actuators you use look like they're commercial off-the-shelf components, and I was wondering if that's also the case for the electronics and the onboard computation and everything else. Yes, absolutely. So again, as we just mentioned, you know, I like I, uh, part of the the driving force behind all this is accessibility, and. You know, the, the ability to create robots using commercial off-the-shelf parts has been one of my driving, feature, uh, driving goals so that we can make as many people have robots as possible. That's not a, that's not a strict limitation. And so there was a, a project that we worked on where we're, rather than using a, uh, like, let's say an Arduino, like an off-the-shelf Arduino with some, some off-the-shelf daughter board, we, we created our own uh, custom circuit boards using uh, the, the same design system. And we can do something like that where we, we have this trade-off where an off-the-shelf solution will give you this level of functionality, a custom solution will give you this other level of functionality, but at this other cost. And so we can sort of uh, play with the slider there between cost and time and efficiency and so on. Um, the, the examples all, all I gave up here were all done using off-the-shelf electronics, off-the-shelf everything other than the, 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 the printable mechanical part, which is a piece of paper, a 3D printed body, or so on. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. Thanks, Ankur. Thank you. Go